Thank you for joining us for Breaking Down Barriers, our special on race relations in Las Vegas and America. I'm Brian Loftus and I'm joined by Kirsten Joyce and Bianca Holman. During the next hour, we're going to present race related issues in our community from how police deal with the minority community to challenges and discrimination many people face in their jobs and day to day lives. And we also have a panel that's going to discuss these issues with us. We'll hear from them throughout the hour. Right now, the thing on so many minds across the nation is the shooting of a black man, Jacob Blake, by police officers in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That set off even more protests and debates in living rooms this week. There were peaceful protests during the day, but at night buildings were set on fire in Kenosha. That led to some violent clashes in the street, culminating with a 17-year-old Caucasian male from a town 30 miles away being arrested and charged with the shooting death of two people and the wounding of a third. That happened Tuesday night. Then on Thursday, pro sports teams started canceling their postseason in protest. Now, each new video of a police shooting we see can be a traumatic incident for black people that takes an emotional toll, building anxiety and fear. And for many black parents, it's a reminder of how they have to guide their children through racism they may encounter in their daily lives. Oh, you already saw it. That's not fair. A weekend afternoon with the Marintic family is just like any other, watching TV, playing games. Anthony and Belinda are both educators, and they've got five children, and of the youngest three, one at each academic level, all active and high achieving. Same goes for the Boone family, Casina, a Vegas native, and her husband, Anthony. Even though their five children are older, quality time together is important. And with recent events, they've had emotional family talks. I kind of have a conversation uh, daily regarding racism. When I'm out in the community, somebody else, you know, who does not understand the culture, who does not understand what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, they might perceive it as threatening. From images of slavery and lynchings to violence against unarmed black people at the hands of fellow citizens or police, in recent years, from Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, George Floyd, the names, the headlines, and the videos. Demisha Mingo, a mental health expert, realizes these experiences have a lasting impression. For black people and minorities, it's going to be even greater trauma because they're the victims of it. It was heart wrenching. You know, I, you imagine like, what if this was my child in this situation? Parents want their kids to get home alive. Well, every time my children leave the house, we tell them to be careful, be safe, we love you. 16-year-old Aaron, who ranks in the top 10% of his class, isn't shielded from these horrific acts. A uh, surprise for me to see a video just like that. For Cassina and Anthony's son, Logan, who has autism, he worries even more. It's a sense of hopelessness, like, well, imagine me trying to already articulate myself to other people who don't understand what I go through. The Marintic and Boone families have members in law enforcement, so they want their kids to be informed and still inspired to spark change in society. Aaron believes people of all races protesting together and spreading awareness on social media is a start. I feel like more people need to speak out because there's a lot of people that are just look at it and then just turn the other way. A, a problem doesn't get solved by like, you know, just like turning away. Everyone, white, Hispanic and Asian, must talk about racism and social injustice. And it also allows for the other people to see how we need to band together to protect everyone. Mingo says be direct, open and honest, but standing up for equality is shown in our everyday actions. Life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you respond to it. Just get involved to make it better. So that's where we instill that hope. All right, now joining us now is our panel for the night, helping to provide us with some insight on these subjects. Craig Knight is the general manager at Power 88.1 and Kennedy Coben Richardson, who is the executive director of Nevada Partners. And that's a group that's been in the community for nearly 30 years, tackling issues like housing and other areas of community need, largely in the historic West Las Vegas. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Kennedy, uh, you can answer this first one. Let's talk about what's on everyone's minds right now. Kenosha, Wisconsin, what are your thoughts on the shooting and and what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17 year old who was arrested for shooting two people. Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, this is a story that we keep seeing in the news. Um, and it started certainly before George Floyd. And it just lets us know that even in a situation where everyone is thinking about this, it still happens. So it's just, it's a little bit unsettling that uh, these kinds of things will happen. It just really reminds you that black lives, you know, do not have the same value as other lives. Therefore, 
based on the data, then we're the first to get killed for, you know, really low level offenses, criminalizing things like selling cigarettes um, and, and, and other things that really don't require the death penalty. And even if you're guilty of a crime, it is not up to the police to decide on the spot whether or not you should live or die. And the fact that police still have qualified immunity is also a problem. And so uh, Kenosha particularly, uh, it really saddens me. I am encouraged though by the public outcry, uh, both in the sports arena as well as nationwide and even in internationally. And so I do believe that we are the ones we're waiting for. It is going to take this kind of pressure in order to make people change. And so I'm, I'm confident, at, or I should say hopeful, that we can move forward. Yeah. Craig, what about you? Uh, thoughts on Kenosha? Well, um, first, thank you for having us because uh, it's great to see everyone coming together once again. You know, first it was George Floyd and now we're looking at Jacob Blake. Um, I think that what the problem is, is that um, there's a double standard. There's a double standard from the bottom to the top all the way across the board when it comes to uh, black people and people of color, right? And so we have a situation here where four years ago uh, this month, Colin Kaepernick kneeled about this, you know, and then and the whole message was hijacked and made about the flag and the military, and it wasn't that at all. So here we are four years later, and it's come back to haunt us again, and it's just a telling message that until we get this right about racism, uh, racism in America, you know, it comes down to this. Like I said the last time I was on here, you're either racist or you're anti-racist, you know. There's no more, I'm not a racist. There's no more that uh, there's a silent middle anymore. You know, uh, you know, if you're complacent, if you're silent, then you're complicit. That's what it comes down to. And the last thing I want to say is that um, right now we're living in a divided state of America. And there's two parallel realities. There's the real reality, then there's an alternate reality. And it's actually moving at the same time in real time. So right now, we have to focus and realize that it's not about who's right, it's about getting it right for the sake of our democracy. All right, thank you both for sharing your insight on just that recent event that has happened. Um, and we really appreciate you. We know that you're gonna come and share your thoughts throughout the show. Kirsten? Yeah. Thank you, Bianca. Working toward policing reforms, that has been the main focus of the protest across the country. Up next, the I-Team's George Knapp talks with police about what changes have been made so far this year and what else could change going forward. The death of George Floyd at the hands of police officers in Minnesota earlier this year set off a wave of racial unrest and street demonstrations across the country, including right here in Las Vegas. Metro police officials say they've been ahead of the curve when it comes to reforms. But what have they done to prepare for this moment? The I-Team's George Knapp has the story. Kenosha, Wisconsin is the latest flashpoint in what has been a hot, violent summer of racial unrest. The death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officers ignited massive demonstrations and long simmering anger about police use of force against racial minorities. Las Vegas demonstrations began as peaceful protests but erupted into violence and bloodshed. There were confrontations in the streets. An armed man was shot and killed by police. An officer was shot and injured. Metro officials thought they were ready. Anger coming from the people that were out there. Um, and, and listen, rightfully so, right? I mean, they're, they're angry at the injustice of, of what they had seen in, in Minnesota and in other states. Metro officials admit they were surprised by the level of anger directed at police officers during the demonstration. Demonstrations because the department has made so much progress on race relations in recent years. Las Vegas, once known as the Mississippi of the West, has shed its segregationist past, but tensions with police have reemerged from time to time in response to notorious use of force incidents that resulted in deaths. Metro reached its turning point 10 years ago. Coming off of 2010, where we'd had more officer involved shootings than we'd ever had in the history of, of Metro. <clears throat> and Although the number was concerning, I think that the most concerning piece is that we realized that we were shooting a high number of unarmed minorities in our community. And we realized we had to do something about that. Did you grade a number two? Go to her line. And they have. 
One area of change, the hiring process. More rigid background checks on officer applicants, as well as polygraph and psychological screenings to weed out racists or potential problem cops. The department has dramatically increased its outreach to minority communities as part of a recruitment effort to hire more minority officers. Training has also changed, not just for new hires, but for veterans too. Reality-based training teaches officers how to better handle touchy situations to avoid the use of deadly force. When deadly force is used, each incident is openly discussed in public briefings. That's up to our training and counseling officers to teach those recruits uh, in the academy and in the in-service training. It never stops. So it never stops. You. So something happens like George Floyd, do you talk to officers and say, hey, this, oh, oh, this cannot fly. That discussion has been had department-wide by every, by every leader in this organization. It was clearly unacceptable. We do a comprehensive reporting on all our use of force at the end of the year, and we compare it to subsequent years. That document is on LVMPD.com. Uh, that has been recognized as the best police practice in the country. Uh, very uh, similar situated agencies have copied over that type of reporting. As long as Metro hires humans to be police officers, mistakes will happen. But changes made by Metro have made it easier to monitor officers' behavior, to watch for signs that an officer is targeting minorities or using excessive force, and to make sure those who cross the line no longer carry a badge. In the weeks since the Las Vegas protests, thousands of hours of body cam video have been reviewed by Internal Affairs. I've been in this job almost 20 years. If there are bad cops out there, I don't want them standing next to me out there in the community. I don't want them on the department. If they're doing bad things and doing bad things to our citizens, then I will help them find their way out of this department. If the officer is right, I want to prove that fact. We do every day look at ways to get better. We're, we're imperfect for sure, but it's not for lack of trying. What do you want me to do? George Knapp, 8 News Now. Let's bring Craig Knight, the general manager of Power 88.1 radio station, and Kennedy Cobb Richardson, executive director at Nevada Partners, back in. Craig, let's have you weigh in first. You heard some of the changes there made by Metro. Do you think that's being reflected in the community? What more immediate changes do you think needs to be made? So, yes, some of those changes I know about because I sit on the MAC committee, that's the Metro Multicultural Advisory Council, and uh, we actually helped with a lot of those changes. And uh, the one thing I have to give credit to Metro for is that before George Floyd, um, body cams were already put in place, and you don't see that in Kenosha. We also had um, uh, implementing um, use of force policy. We helped make some, some changes with that. And I would say real quickly, the only thing I can see, and I've, I've said this to the police officers that I know and to the sheriff, that um, the community would like to see a little bit more accountability when it comes to the officers. We see too much officers getting away with stuff or going on what we call paid vacation, and then they're not prosecuted, and, it's, and it's, that's it. It's just over with. So those are some of the things, like accountability and, and connecting with the community and seeing these accountabilities. Thank you so much for your thoughts there, Craig. Kennedy, yours as well. So I do applaud the department here locally about uh, the changes they're making. For sure, I've also worked with Metro regarding hiring uh, women and other minorities into the uh, academy, and so I know that they are earnest about what's happening. However, what we're talking about is really a culture change, and as well as this is something that's in our DNA, racism, um, and has been for the last 12 generations. So it's just, it's from a training perspective, it's gonna take more, um, more than a 12 hour uh, curriculum, uh, more than just weeding out certain uh, people because I, I actually think it's a continuum rather. Um, there's racism and there's less racist. Um, and we're all subject to it based on, you know, how America has operated for the last 400 years. Kenny, the second issue we'd like to hear from you on, and you just tackled it there too, the challenges with weeding out the bad cops you mentioned. How do you think that can be addressed? So the cops currently, um, it's like a fraternity. And so I have quite a few friends who, uh, and women uh, who are in the force, and they definitely say that if you do not act in the way that they expect, um, you are 
isolated and you know uh, you're not part of the group anymore and if you have to work there every day i don't think that's a great place to be and so i think there's a lot of pressure particularly from peers in order to sort of back blue um, no matter what line they fall under and unfortunately because the original policing was slave catching it's also in there again it's in their dna to sort of devalue black lives uh, and shoot first if someone's big or tall muscular, then they're automatically dangerous on site without having any real guns or um, any aggression at all. And so uh, if you have 500 cops for 20 or bad, it's bad for everybody. And so it's really important to weed out all of them. And Craig, uh, your input as well on this. Uh, cultural training probably needs to happen more because we see a lot of police officers that are not from these communities and they come in from what I understand, you know, I, I've heard that there's almost a fear factor put in when it comes to the black community. You have to be careful or you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of action there, you know, and stuff like that. And it's almost like it's premeditated and it's being put in somebody's back of their mind that they can be in danger by a black person who's unarmed. And I think that if there's any police officers out there that's afraid of unarmed black men, you might wanna uh, change your career. All right, thank you to you both. Bianca? black police officers. Up next, I sit down with some officers who see things with a unique lens to talk about their lives, their roles as officers, and what changes they like to see. As protests continue across the nation around the death of George Floyd and the issue of policing, black police officers are finding themselves in the middle on an emotional tightrope. We caught up with Metro police officers about their life being black while wearing blue. My son was nine years old and he said, mom, you can't take that job. You don't look like a police officer. Like, what does a police officer look like? Arnold Parker is a current officer with Metro. Regina Coward Holman retired from the force after 27 years. Both took an oath to protect and serve, just like Adrian Hunt, who also wants to make a difference in his hometown. Everybody has their calling, my calling is service. But as black police officers, all three say there's a struggle. No peace! Especially as protests against police brutality erupt across the country. I've had plenty of calls, you know, in the last past two, three months with officers saying like, man, I just don't know how to feel because we're stuck in the middle. The death of unarmed black Americans like Breonna Taylor, who was shot in her home, and George Floyd, who died in police custody, have prompted calls for change. I had no words. That was by far the most reckless police act I've seen all my whole life. Tension between police and the black community isn't new. From the first slave patrol groups in the 1700s to segregation and Jim Crow in the 1960s, violence and racism towards black Americans resulted in protests and uprising. Now, in the year 2020, law enforcement is under the microscope. For Coward Holman, it's an ongoing discussion with her son. Hunt and Parker share experiences as black men who've been profiled. I was probably 13, 14, coming out the Meadows Mall. Um, I had shotguns to, to my face, me and a couple buddies. But nobody ever said, okay, you know what? You know, we're sorry about that, it was a mix up. When I take this uniform off, I'm just a black man. So what is the next person, how are they looking at me? Hunt says he's been questioned while in uniform. And I had people telling me, what, you know, what you over there for? You need to be over here with us, you know? And it never crossed my mind that where I'm supposed to be, I know where I'm supposed to be. But they are where they're supposed to be. You got kids that, <clears throat> say that, hey, you know what, like, I never want to be a police officer. Talking about kids that, used to, you know, they gangbang, currently gangbang, to where now they actually think about being a police officer. Officers agree discussions about racial biases with co-workers can promote change on the job and in society. Hunt says the Black Police Officers Association helps bridge the gap, but black officers say there has to be intentional effort from everyone. Always push and push into, you know, to get more uh, people who look like me to join the department. We have to continue to have the conversations about black lives, about systemic racism, about changes from the police department, being transparent, being accountable. And joining us are Craig Knight, the general manager of Power 88.1 radio station, and Kennedy Cobbin Richardson, executive director at Nevada Partners. Now, the Black Officers Association, they raised some interesting points. Kennedy, what are your thoughts about um, having more black officers on the police department? 
Certainly, it is important to bring more black officers into the force for the simple reason that the force should look like the community that it serves. And with that being said, a lot of times um, they are not welcome as well into the force. So they do have uh, a, a really high road to climb. And then it's also important that they're comfortable in the communities that they serve as well. So you can't, as Craig said, you can't go in and be afraid of that community that you are supposed to protect. And I have two little girls who uh, are really afraid and fearful of just seeing a cop. And I, and I hurt for them because I believe the youth, really, if you want to grow up to be something, you'll never be a cop because you don't, you're afraid of who they are and how they treat you. Well, thank you for sharing that, Craig. Uh, the officers also talked about how they've been profiled in their lives. Can, can you address that? You know, what is that, that mental um, impact on those officers? Yeah, it's, it's almost a double jeopardy. It's like, you know, being a police officer in uniform, that uniform uh, represents some bad experiences. So it's almost like a lot of the officers are painted with a broad brush, but just like black people in the community are painted with a broad brush. There's like prejudices that go both ways on that. But with the black officer, like I said, it's a double jeopardy because when they take the uniform off, they're still black. And then they got to deal with the, you know, systemic racism and, and, and they have to deal with the prejudices of, of, of not even people not even knowing they're officer. So and, and then within the uh, department itself, you know, the question is, how do they feel? That's got to be kind of uncomfortable, especially when things like this happen with the latest, you know, being with uh, Jacob Blake. There has to be some kind of uncomfortable. They, they're like right in the middle. And I think that it's uh, once again, it just comes down to we have to remove the, uh, the the racism and the prejudices and look at people for who they are and look at their heart, you know, yeah. definitely impacting everybody. Brian. Bianca, thank you. Facing day to day discrimination up next, the I team's Vanessa Murphy tells us about one case of discrimination at a local country club. And our panel is back talking about facing discrimination in day to day life. Stay with us. May and June saw protests here in Las Vegas, along with those around the rest of the country. Sean Torrey is a native Las Vegas PhD student and co-founder of the mentorship program King of Jewels. We spoke with him about why he joined in the protest to have his voice heard. How do you assess the protests that happened here in Las Vegas? This tragedy that happened to George Floyd, George Floyd was something a lot bigger than what we've seen in the past. Like a lot of people started taking it seriously. We've seen different communities come out um, this time around, which was great. Like you've seen the Amish community, you've seen people from the Jewish community, you've seen a lot of people who are supporters and allies come out for black lives because now they see like, oh my goodness, like this, and this is something that's continuously going on and people are fed up. However, the protests definitely start, the protests definitely have helped, but it's not the end game. Uh, we have to be uh, involved in our local poli uh, our local um, our local politics uh, politics. We have to be involved in the state and federal. So those are things that people need to be aware of and be involved in. We always hear people say, "Well, I'm not racist." Yeah. What? How important is it for those people that maybe haven't experienced racism, and they don't perpetuate it? They're, they say, "Well, I'm not racist." How important is it for them to be anti-racist? And for somebody who's maybe not familiar with that phraseology, expand on that for people to really be anti-racist in their lives. But it all stems with it all stems from empathy, right? That's mm -hmm. where we start. I may not understand what you uh, what you've experienced. I may not understand what it's like to walk in these shoes. Or to, for for myself, I'm a born and raised in America. I do not know what it's like to be an immigrant to come here to this country. I recognize my privilege in that, and I stand with immigrants who come here to make a better life, do everything they need to do, and know much more about America than most Americans do, right? But I'm not an immigrant, but I understand that, you know, you know what? I have empathy for that person because they, they, came, they came across this country for a better life and they wanted to do more for the next generations to come. So if I can have empathy, if myself or many others can have empathy for someone who I culturally don't connect with, or also someone who's not from this country, how can we do the same for people who were born in this country and who has a systemic issue and history of being oppressed? Why can't we do that? Just be open-minded. 
Uh, you don't have to agree with it, but like, it happens. Just because you don't see it, just because it's never happened to you, does not mean it happens. And just because, so for example, just because you're an immigrant doesn't mean we're just only talking about folks on the border of Mexico. You forget a whole nother, a whole nother coast as well who come from Africa, who come from these different countries, who are just trying to make a better life for themselves as well. All right, let's get back into it with Craig Knight, General Manager of Power 88.1 and Kennedy Cobb and Richardson, Executive Director at Nevada Partners. Craig, we're going to begin with you. Sean there in that uh, brief interview talked about empathy, essentially realizing your experience isn't everyone else's experience. How important is that in finding some type of resolution? Uh, it's very important uh, because I think the problem is, is that um, we have to define what is America. You know, uh, America is one thing on paper, but it's another thing in reality. And I think that's part of the problem. Uh, you, you know, with the racism going on and the racists, that I think they feel like that this is their country and it's no one else's. However, uh, this country was built. Uh, on slavery by black people, but also built by immigrants that come into this country. So there's a share in this country and there's a share in the liberty and justice for all. But right now it's liberty and justice for some, and that's the problem. Kennedy, continuing on this theme of empathy, especially in a time of such great division in our country, how do we get folks to really think about the experience of others, to look at the other side, to look at both sides? How do we get people to do that? To get people to really understand, I think the first thing you do is, has, is to listen. Uh, I think that people don't just want to, they want to put in their own experience and say, well, I don't know that. But that really discounts our lived experiences when you tell us, you know, well, I can make it because, you know, I worked hard and all you have to do is work hard as well. And really disregard all of the barriers and obstacles put in a person's way to make a living, to buy a house, to get educated. And there are so many barriers to that. But if you believe me when I tell you that this is my experience, instead of making excuses for why I should not believe that would be the first step. Kennedy and Craig, we continue to appreciate your wisdom. We're going to be back with you uh, with another interview in a matter of minutes. Coming up, one Las Vegas mother is fighting a country club in federal court after a state agency backed her claim of racial discrimination. It happened at the exclusive Red Rock Country Club. The I-team's Vanessa Murphy has more on why the fight isn't over and how two biracial children are right at the center of it all. Carmel Mary Hill's biracial daughters are learning about racism at an early age. It's like Jesse, Jesse Wolf. and Bella, and I'm five years old, and she's eight years old. This was an interview with the mother and her daughters one year ago after the Nevada Equal Rights Commission issued a probable cause finding of racial discrimination and retaliation at Red Rock Country Club. In 2016, Hill, a tennis instructor, brought her daughters to use the club's daycare while she worked. She says she and other members observed another white instructor use the daycare for his two white children. According to this complaint, a white, wealthy, and longtime country club member who Hill and her attorney have not publicly named was overheard stating, whose black kids are these, and complained to management. Five days later, Hill was fired, and after she reported it to the Equal Rights Commission, she was banned from the property. What were you thinking? Mm, I burst into tears. The commission ordered Red Rock Country Club to provide discrimination training to all employees and incorporate Equal Employment Opportunity Commission guidance on workplace policies. Hill and her attorney filed this federal lawsuit. One year later, Hill says an agreement still has not been reached and she is still banned from the property, which affects Jesse and Bella, who play tennis. My daughters were asked by certain people to play doubles with them and I had to let them know that we couldn't play that tournament um, because I was not allowed to step foot on Red Rock um, premises. The I-team reached out to an attorney for Red Rock Country Club to confirm whether Hill is still banned from the property, what changes the club has made, and whether the woman who made the comment about Jesse and Bella is still a member, and whether the manager who fired Hill still works there. The attorney said no comment. I want them to realize that you can't do this to people. 
and that there are consequences to actions, and that's what we try and teach our kids, right? It's also a lesson for others that racism is real. I see it from the other side now of uh, what African Americans have to go through on a daily basis. A white person's given more privilege than a black person. Vanessa Murphy, 8 News Now. So let's talk about that day-to-day -day discrimination that so many people face. Kennedy, explain implicit bias and how it plays out in day-to-day -day life. So in day-to-day -day life, we are subject to a variety of different biases that include lower pay, being unheard, invisible in meetings, even when you're on the corporate floor. Um, you must be uh, better than your coworkers in order to just get simply noticed. You get the toughest assignments, the worst sales territories. Um, gathering together with other blacks is threatening. You're passed over for promotion. And in, in many ways, people are only promoting or doing things for people who look like themselves. And so they're biased against people who don't look like them. And so therefore, they don't even know what's happening. Um, but they're they're still guilty of it. And unfortunately, on our side, that reduces our self-esteem. Um, it allows us to feel invisible, causes toxic stress. Um, and then we have to put up with it because it's our livelihood. And so what are you going to do? Quit um, because you feel that way. But over time, you are broken down and you have less job satisfaction. You just don't want to be there anymore. And then what's really bad is that no one can, will admit to it. And so you're just left to, left to suffer with it on your own. No one can admit to it. Let's talk about that, Craig. Let's talk about when people see implicit bias. And we've talked before about being an anti-racist. For the man or woman watching this right now in their day-to-day -day life, how can they go about their life and be an anti-racist? Well, uh, they can do that by every time they uh, recognize racism or they hear of racism, they need to speak up and they need to stand up. And, and it's not just in front of black people or people of color. They need to do it when black people or people of color are not around. That's the big test right there. That has to happen. So it's not a, a, a phony, uh, you know, standing up for us because we're around just putting on a show. But there's something that's deep rooted that has to be uprooted. And the only way it can happen is everyone has to be true to themselves. If you really believe that racism is bad, systemic racism, and you know what's happening, you got to stand with us. You have to be allies. Something that is deep rooted that has to be uprooted. Craig and Kennedy, thank you again. We'll be back with you shortly. Kirsten. Asians facing discrimination. What local members of the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities say they deal with here and how they're making efforts to improve it next when breaking down barriers continues. Asian Americans are the fastest growing ethnic group in Southern Nevada, but many in our community have recently experienced blatant discrimination due to the coronavirus, which first originated in China. 8 News Now reporter Orko Mana shares their struggles, but also how they're working to create change. He followed me and he spit on me and he like, like threw some food on my car. It's an encounter UNLV junior Ava Carino will never forget. This past spring, as COVID-19 started spreading in the U.S., Carino tells me someone accused her of having the virus just because she's Asian. I was feeling sort of like apprehensive because I didn't know how to react. I haven't dealt with such an aggressive form of discrimination at that at that form in my life. Carino is Filipina American, born and raised in Las Vegas. In the past, she mostly experienced microaggressions, which are subtle statements made against marginalized groups. But she says the coronavirus has thrown the door to discrimination wide open. This is something else that needs to be stopped right now. Please go home, leave, go back to Asia. Those are words Matthew Dang never expected his family to hear in the wake of COVID-19. His father berated while out shopping. It was just really upsetting. Dang, who is Vietnamese teaches second grade at Arturo Cambero Elementary School, but over the last couple months, he's been trying to educate the public. People have been acting a bit racist and xenophobic towards them. Through videos like these. Stories, I think, are the best vehicle for change. Dane created this Instagram page consisting of a collection of COVID-related experiences from Asians across the country. A look back with a path forward. Make it more accessible for people to view and to have something also to reflect upon so we could uh, avoid uh, more situations where um, 
discrimination and racism gets targeted against um, this group of folks. Different organizations here in the Las Vegas Valley are also trying to make a difference through empowerment and engagement. We try to make sure that their voices are being uh, uplifted. Taiwanese American Eric Jing is the deputy director of One APIA Nevada, a group advocating for policies that help Asians and Pacific Islanders. We spoke to Jing at Chinatown Plaza, where many Asian owned businesses have struggled because of what they call anti Asian sentiment, even at the highest levels of government. When they talk about China flu or Kong flu or China virus, it doesn't help. It makes uh, the community feel like they somehow are being discriminated against. And I think that's something that hurts. But the duel against discrimination needs the next generation to join the fight. I feel like we've been forgotten. And the more that we can stand up and do something about it, the better. Filipina American Erica Mosca founded the nonprofit Leaders in Training, which works with high school and college students. They talk about the inequities facing all ethnicities, including Asians, and they inspire action. And empower them to do something about it, whether it's volunteering, advocating, um, go and lobbying their legislatures to do something about it now and in the future. I'm going to go into grad school. At 20 years old, Cariño is part of that future. While our oppression isn't as visible as other as other marginalized groups of people, it's still prevalent in, other, in our lives. Denouncing discrimination while pushing for progress. Orco Mana, 8 News Now. And once again, we're going to have the GM of Power 88.1 radio station Craig Knight weigh in along with Nevada Partners Executive Director Kennedy Coppin Richardson. So last segment, we talked about discrimination that people face on a day to day level. Craig, the group we just heard from leaders in training, they've got volunteers going into high schools to get the younger people engaged. Do you think this is the kind of thing we need more of? Absolutely, um, because first of all, um, racism is a taught behavior and mindset. If you notice that if you put um, children of all races together in a sandbox, they will play and not even know that, you know, anything is wrong or anything is different. It's not until the adults tell them, like, no, you can't play with them because and then the stereotypes come. So what the Asian community is experiencing right now is what the black community has experienced since, since 16, 19. Kennedy, thank you, Craig. Kennedy, as a community activist, how important is it to talk to young people and change their minds early? I think it's really important, and I'm particularly inspired by Gen Z. They, if you just look at the TikTok feed, they are very vocal, very thoughtful, uh, and really have some really great views. Racism is a social construct to categorize human value. And to the extent that anyone is debased or devalued based on inherited characteristics, the way you look, the color of your skin, your eye folds, all of that from a human standpoint is wrong. We are 99.9% .9 scientifically alike. And so I don't condone any discrimination against any person for any reason. Thank you, Kennedy. Thank you, Craig. Brian. Black owned businesses up next. One woman trying to blaze a new path in her own business shares her story and why it is important to support similar businesses in the community and some final thoughts for the show. August is National Black Business Month, and that is one way people can help the community by supporting those businesses. Rocky Theus introduces us to one local businesswoman continuing to make her way as a local pioneer in a new industry. Hard work, dedication, motivation, drive. That's what comes to mind when Kima Ogden, the owner of Top Notch The Health Center, thinks of black owned businesses. She is one of the only black female owners in the cannabis industry and the only one in Nevada that has equity in it. I think the common misconceptions that people have of black owned businesses is that we're unorganized, we're cheap, we're um, for lack of a better word, ghetto, it's really far from the truth. So what she's saying is, we have to be twice as good as our counterparts to be successful. You have to be twice as knowledgeable. You have to be more prepared. Um, it, it definitely is, as a woman in general, in a, in a world of executives that are men, you all already have to do that. But as a minority, 
it takes it even up a notch. Hence why Kima's business is top notch. We're like a big family here, but yet we compete with some of the big giants in town. And that's a big deal considering what it took to get here. Yeah, this industry was built on the on the backs of minorities. You know, we've always been involved in and um, different areas of different industries and we really don't get this, the justice when it comes to being able to be involved in the industry when it finally materializes and monetizes. As a Las Vegas native and entrepreneur, there was no better place for Kima to build. As a whole, there's a lot of opportunity here. You really have to hit the ground floor though with change in the industry you want to be involved in or get really involved in legislation to make sure you get a fair shake. At the end of the day, as a black or minority business owner, it's not about you, it's about your community, and that's how you stay strong. We are very fortunate because the community, we do a lot of community advocacy work, we do a lot of community give back. Um, I've done that prior to this business, I've always been involved in that, and I think that's why the community as a whole gives back as well to us. They support us, we support them. That was Rocky Theus doing that story for us. Let's jump in right there. Craig Knight, GM at Power 88.1. Craig, what can people do to be proactively in support of black businesses? What would you recommend? I would recommend just spending your dollars with them. Um, you know, looking over the list, there's uh, Devin Moore has a list called uh, Go Urban Vegas, and it has a listing of all of the black businesses in the community and, 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 and it's a variety of different black businesses, more than just restaurants, barbershops and beauty shops, but he has lawyers, he has uh, uh, accountants, bankers, you name it, it's on that list. So what we have to do as a black community, we have to spend our dollars more with each other because from what I understand, the black dollar only lasts in the black community for six hours. Where other cultures, it lasts for 30 days, 27 mm -hmm. days, Etc. So I would say just whatever it is you're trying to do, see if there's a black business that has that product or service that you're looking for first. And, and Craig, remind people where they can find that assembled list. GoUrbanVegas.com. Excellent. Thank you. Kennedy uh, and Craig, you guys have both given us so much wisdom over the past hour. If we could in these final minutes of the show, uh, and Kennedy, we'll start with you. If you could just leave a final thought, a parting message for those that are watching us on this Friday night, something that they can walk away with. I would say to seize the day. This is the third iteration of civil rights from uh, Reconstruction era in the 1800s to uh, the civil rights movement in uh, the 60s and now the Black Lives Matter movement today. And we're not waiting on a uh, charismatic leader to lead us. We're the ones that we've been waiting for. So every person is responsible for changing this tide. They are responsible for uh, standing up um, for uh, what's right in every place they live, work, play, and worship. And if everyone takes that responsibility and, and goes for it with that, denounces it when they see it, and dismantle racism, particularly in structural ways, then I think we can move forward as a country. And Kennedy, before we go to Craig, when you say stand up for what is right and, and jump in, how do you recommend people do that? How do you recommend that they do that in their own lives? They need to know that their voice matters. And so if you're at the country club and you see something happening, like we saw in an earlier segment, then you have to write a letter as well. You have to pick up the phone and say, I don't like what I saw. And you have to be vocal about that. And so if you're getting 15, 20 phone calls, maybe you'll change something, but don't just leave it to the victims of certain uh, certain instances to, to stand up for themselves. Say that I, I agree with them and I wanna see change as well. Craig, what message can you impart and leave with our viewers watching this special? I would say that right now we're living where we have four generations living at the same time. We have the baby boomers, which is my parents. We have Generation X, which is my generation, the millennials and Gen Z. We have a grand opportunity to learn from each other and work together to build a better today and a, and a brighter tomorrow. So we just have to listen to each other. Um, and like Kennedy alluded to uh, earlier, Gen Z, that TikTok, that technology, they have something to bring and offer. You know, uh, my generation, Generation X, we were actually the children of the civil rights movement. When our parents and grandparents were out there with John Lewis and Martin Luther King, we were babies. We were just born or we were children. And they fought for us so that we can continue to fight. I'm 55 years old. 
um, the right to vote is only 55 years old. It wasn't that long ago where we couldn't vote. So I like to say to those who um, don't think their vote matters or, or its value, it does value and it does matter. Otherwise, why would they try to suppress and take it from you? You have to understand that. That's part of democracy. A brighter tomorrow, you say, Craig, and I love hearing that. Better days ahead. It is a very challenging time. Let's all hope for that. Boy, we couldn't have had better guests. Thank you both so much for being with us and imparting all this wisdom over the past hour on a multitude of topics. We do so appreciate it. Thank we you. appreciate you. Thank you. Bianca Kirsten. Yes, thank you so much for joining us with this important community conversation. Yes, we do have some extra interviews from people in the special on our website at 8newsnow.com. Have a wonderful evening.